Um, there are some very nice simplifications that happen because we work with uh, with sort of first order single um, differential equations. Okay, and um, <clears throat> let's see, I think the example we had last time was of um, logistic, I mean, exponential growth and logistic growth. Correct? <clears throat> Those are the two examples. So today I want to kind of uh, broaden that a little bit, but um, in the end, it's everything can be summarized in a picture of x versus t, right? Where <clears throat> you plot the direction field. Um, I think the book uses the name slope. Uh, or, um, I'm sorry, it's a um, slope field, right? So they use the name slope field for um, basically the, the slopes <coughs> that solutions of this differential equation have to satisfy at each, at each point x and t, right? So if you want at some initial I want to say what the um, value of the solution is at some t naught. Let me say that's x naught. Then this means that we're looking for the curve that goes through this point, right? <clears throat> and um, has to obey, you know, the slope field. You know, which could be. I don't know. Let me just. So it's just gonna have to obey the prescribed slopes at each point, including you know initial point. Okay. So that's basically what it means um, that x, as a function of t, solves this differential equation with this initial condition. Okay. Now, of course. If you change the initial condition, you're going to have possibly a different. I mean, you, you're, you're going to have different um, solution. So I'm going to use a different. Right? There's going to be other solutions that each are going to obey the you know the the differential equation, right? But there is a result that we're going to talk about later, which is going to say that, um, you know, under fairly general condition on this differential equation, you prescribe the initial condition, and you're going to get an unique solution. Okay. So in other words, there will not be two curves that kind of self-intersect. I mean, excuse me, intersect. Okay. So. I'm going to say that um, um, under certain conditions on F, the right hand side, the solution x, x of t exists and is unique. Okay. Um, of star. Let me call this star. Okay. So once you prescribe the point, there's a unique curve that goes through that point. In other words, in other words. Um, if 
for each point t naught x naught in the plane there is an unique solution there's a unique curve there is an unique solution curve going through that point Okay, and just to, um, since you can kind of see that it's fairly difficult to do it by hand, I mean to do by hand, uh, direction field or slope field, <clears throat> I want to um, open MATLAB and, and show you sort of a tool that generates this direction fields and slope fields. Um, let's see, have I talked about, about this at all, how to um, open this? So. If you've never um, accessed MATLAB, you know you don't have it or whatever. Then there is a way to get um, access online. So any place you have internet access, um, there are instructions here in the uh, resource link. There's instructions on the um, College of Engineering website. Go to Help Sheets and go to Instructions. Anyway, it's a PDF file. It talks about this, and if you have a Windows or or, or a Mac. Um, but bottom line is, there is a server here whose name is RATS1 or RATS2.es.ucs.edu and so forth. Um, <clears throat> that you can you can remotely um, connect. So remote desktop connection. So that's what I just did. When you connect, you end up with, um, let's see, you know, you're kind of re remotely on that computer. And then uh, you open MATLAB. And You know, you can do this also in the lab, so you don't have to remotely connect. But um, wherever you are, you have to kind of go and download this direction field code. So um, it's also linked on our website. So you just go there on our website, resources. There is a so-called D field 7. So let's... Uh, It should have been fixed by now. Um, if you right click and you save, so th this is a file that we're gonna we're gonna access. So one needs to save it on a local machine. Okay, and this comes from uh, Rice University. Okay, so you can you can go to this website and read uh, more about this software. But just want to show you really quick how. Um, how to run it. So let's say you open MATLAB and this is, you know, uh, you're at the, what's called the command line. So you have the prompt there. Uh, once you downloaded the, the file, you just call it. <coughs> okay. And this, this uh, dialog box comes up. asks you for the differential equation that you want to um, plot the direction field. Um, so let's see. Let's take uh, the following one. x minus x cubed and there you have the direction field. So you have Um, what does this represent? So this is t-axis, x-axis, and at various points, um, 
like for, let's say for t equals 0, right? <clears throat> for t equals 0, say x equals 0. Then there's going to be a um, direction here, which may or may not, not be plotted, but if you kind of extrapolate this, you would see that this direction is horizontal, right? Because it's x minus x cubed, so when x is 0, the slope is 0, right? Uh, then as x increases, well, up to 1, <coughs> x minus x cubed is going to be positive, right? So you can actually do this a little, bit, a little bit by hand. Then it's going to be negative between negative 1 and 0 and so forth, right? So we can, I think last time we talked a little bit about this. x prime equals x minus x cubed. Okay, And let me say that this is an example where you have this kind of uniqueness, so you don't have self-intersecting. In fact, um, we will see if we can plot something that has, you know, non-uniqueness. But this one is relatively easy. So this is Let's see, x, 1 minus x squared. So this is the right-hand side, right? x, 1 minus x, 1 plus x. So we have three zeros, right? The right-hand side has three zeros. So we're going to have three steady states, right? So the steady states, let's remember, what, what are the steady states? Our numbers are values for x for which the right-hand side equals 0, right? So 0, well, if I put them in increasing order, then it will be negative 1, 0, and 1. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do the direction field, 0 is here, negative 1, and 1. What does it mean that, I mean, what does it imply the right-hand side vanishes? <clears throat> it means the, the slopes are 0 on this uh, horizontal line. So it means that this horizontal line is a solution, right? Because it matches the slopes, right? Every time you have a steady state, you know that basically means you have a constant solution, and so at zero, right? Now, what do we say um, between zero and one, for instance? So, always with this direction field or slope field, I mean. By hand, it's almost impossible to, to plot the, 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 uh, the slope field, right, or the direction field. So I'm going to refrain from doing that. I'm just going to plot a few solutions. But there's always another plot that kind of gives you what? Gives you the, the nature of this, uh, of this steady state. In other words, what happens if I am, let's start with zero, if I'm a little bit above zero, okay? How are, what is the solution going to happen if I start a little bit above, uh, how is the solution going to behave if I start a little bit above zero or a little bit below zero, right? And how do we decide on that? Again, we have to look at the slope. Slope, so slope means right-hand side, right? We look at the right-hand side, well, let's plot it versus x. It's a cubic. x minus x cubed is cubic, right? And it has three zeros, and it's an odd function. So, and what else we need to know? Does it go to infinity or to minus infinity? I guess that's 
plotting that function, right? Calculus 1, I guess. Uh, does it go to plus or minus infinity? Minus infinity. So it's, it must be going like this, right? Oops, excuse me, this is plus 1. So, what do we read? What do we need to read from this? What, why do we do this? This picture for the <coughs> for the sign of the right hand side, right? So, and then we're going to determine which uh, which which steady states are sources and which ones are sinks. So, how do we do that? Right hand side positive, and then negative before and after negative one. So this means that. I mean, you don't have to memorize this. It just <clears throat> um, let's just do do it here. So between negative one and zero, I said is negative, right? So it's going to be uh, the solutions that start at those points are going to be decreasing here, right? And they're going to be increasing here. Um, and then also here it's going to be, so these are the slopes, right? Increasing and decreasing. Okay. Now, <coughs> there's another thing that we need to consider is, um, okay, this is what happens when t is zero, but what happens when t is some other value? Well, you see the right hand side of this differential equation doesn't depend on t, right? So this is what kind of, we call this kind of equations. Does anybody know? Aut autonomous, right? So if the right hand side independent of t Excuse me, let me, let me just try it. So if the right-hand side <coughs> is uh, independent of t, then um, we call dx dt equals f of x um, autonomous differential equation. And what that basically translates in this direction field is what? It's symmet symmetrical with respect to what? <coughs> it's invariant with respect to t. In other words, if I am to plot the, the slopes corresponding to t equals 1 or, or any other value, right? It's going to be the same as the slopes that correspond to t equals 0 at any t. So in other words, it's going to be invariant on the translations. Okay. The slope field a direction field of such assist, um, an equation is um, invariant on the translations along t axis. Okay? So again, if I want to do the same thing for this value of t, then it's going to be exactly the same That has a, also a further implication about solutions. I mean, not about individual solutions, but um, solutions as taken as a as a whole. So general solutions. So let me let me do the following. Let me say that we found a solution. So the solution is, you know, the solution that starts here is to go up. But we said that it never it can never cross or touch the solution x equals 1, right? 
It can never touch because if it were to touch, then at the point where they would touch, you would have two solutions, right? So we're going to have to, you know, say why we cannot have that, right? But for now, let's just um, kind of um, take it as a fact that they cannot touch. So in other words, it, can, it, it, it keeps increasing, right? But it never um, reaches the, the value 1. And so on the other side. It can never go below 0, right? Now, there's one other thing that it's still not clear. Is that, is that, is that solution going to go <coughs> asymptotically to 1, or maybe is it going to go to 0 0.99? In other words, if I go to t goes to infinity, is it going to go, the limit is going to be 1, or, or maybe there's going to be a gap there? That's also something that you cannot really say from just the slope field. Okay? So all of those things we're going to clarify. But the fact that it's autonomous means the slope field is invariant other translations, right? You take you just move it to the left or right and you see the same picture. It means what? It means that th that curve, if I translate it, I'm going to get what? Let's say translate it to the left. It means that I'm also going to get a curve, right? A solution curve. Right? So it means that when I have, once I have a solution, all the translates are also solutions. Okay. So, pretty much that fills the whole, um, you know, this band. In other words, you pretty much know how all solutions look like, right? And you can see that these solutions, although I just plotted four, it actually fill, you know, you can fill the whole plane. I mean, excuse me, the whole, um, the whole band here, right? At every point, there's going to be one curve that goes through it. An unique curve, right? Same, same between this other band, negative one, zero. I mean, negative one to zero, right? Except this is going downhill, right? Again, all. I mean, one curve and it translates. Oh. I said this is this cannot um, intersect, right? So there have to be. They fill this. They fill the plane, right? Uh, uh, this band, right? And they don't self, They don't intersect. There's a unique curve through each point, okay? And also up and down. I mean, this looks like going down. This uh, going up. And again, translates are the same. So every time you're gonna you're gonna look at an autonomous system or autonomous equation, you should know that. It doesn't really matter um, what you call the initial time. That's that's why it's autonomous. It's 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 not dependent on the initial time per se. In other words, I can I can start saying time starts at zero, right? And then the solutions evolve according to this equation, or I can say time starts at one. The solutions do the same thing. Okay? Translation invariant. So that's where the word autonomous is. Um, in contrast with this is what is non-autonomous? Well, let me, let me finish this here. So, um, since we talked about sink and sources. So, for autonomous systems, because we have steady state, um, we can talk about uh, being um, yeah, let's say negative one. Negative one is a steady state, right? And if I start close to negative one on either side, the solution is going to be going towards negative one. So it's a sink, right? You can, you can also see this, the property that you don't, you cannot intersect. Uh, two solution curves cannot intersect 
uh, implies that you have this squeezing, right? Like if you start here, you, you, cannot, you cannot go above this one. And since this one goes to zero, right, everything has to go, not to zero, to negative one, right? So there's this fact that you cannot uh, cross lines. Um, says that this is a sink, this is a source, and this is a sink. Okay? Of course, the picture here also does the same thing here. And when I'm just clicking here, I'm just um, the program just f computes from negative infinity to infinity, or from some negative big t to some well, okay, from negative two to ten, for instance. Um, and it just plots plots that solution. Okay, but there's nothing explicit. There's no formula. It's just kind of a approximate curve, right? So that's the um, solution curves yeah. as a whole. You can see translate and so forth, translate the variant. Um, Okay, so there are two there are two things that um, can happen in this kind of simple situation when you have autonomous system, but you may actually have some uh, parameters in your equation that vary that change. Okay, so we're going to talk about. A little bit about bifurcations. <coughs> so let me give you this simpler um, example, although we can do it on this um, as well. Okay, let me let me do it on this simpler example, and then um, so let's start with the logistic equation. we talked about last time and that is not x minus x cubed but x, x minus x squared okay so it's x 1 minus x and we said this comes from some sort of population model where you have um, you know you have some growth rate intrinsic growth rate and you have some carrying capacity Now let's just take those um, parameters to be equal to 1. So the picture will look, you know, you have only two steady states, 0 and 1, right? And you have, again, between 0 and 1, the slope is positive, the right-hand side is positive, so it's increasing. And that's sort of the picture of the logistic growth, right? between 0 and 1. Of course, above 1 would be um, going down. Okay. And the corresponding picture for the right-hand side is, is this, right? It's quadratic, so it has a, a, a top, a maximum, and at one half. Okay, so in many models, you know, many models take into account other things. For instance, if this were a population growth, like fish population, it's usually used for um, fish population. If there is harvesting, you know, harvesting is you take something out. Okay, so how do you model that in the equation? You subtract, for instance. I mean, that's just one one very simple example. You subtract 
one constant, say h, from x, uh, from um, from the right hand side. So x prime would be sort of a constant harvesting rate, h. Okay. So in other words, if you, for instance, say, uh, let's ignore this, you know, logistic growth here, and just say, what is x prime? X prime equals negative h means x is decreasing at a rate of h, right? So that with respect to time. So that basically means it's a it's a you know depletion at, at constant rate h. So h is constant harvest rate. Okay? Then how will these pictures change? And that's basically the question. So these two pictures, or the picture is corresponds to h equals zero, right? <clears throat> now, what's going to happen for other values of h? Hmm. with the uh, population dynamics x of t for different values of h, okay? And sort of bifurcation analysis is, is addressing this question um, for a different ra for, for for a range of, of values of h, okay. Not just, I mean, of course, if you just take a value, uh, h equals three, right? Then you're going to get another picture like this, okay? Now, let's see what are the relevant values for h that might change this uh, qualitatively. What happens when you plot the right hand side of that equation with some positive h. It's going to right, it's going to be uh, translated down, right? So this maximum is at one quarter, right? Which happens at one half. So clearly for h equals one quarter there's going to be a change in the I mean, up to h equals one quarter is going to be pretty much the same. So let's uh, let's do the following. Let's say so for h between zero and one quarter, you know, so it could be zero as well. Then the right hand side is going to be. Still, kind of, you know, going above the, uh, uh, being positive for a little, for, for for some values of x. Okay, and it's going to have two zeros, so there's going to be two steady states. Is the nature of these steady states going to change from what it was when h was zero? No, because, let's see, at h equals zero, uh, the zero was a source, right? And one was a sink. So, by the same uh, analysis, you can you can see that The two steady states preserve the same kind of the same um, properties. Of course, the steady states themselves change, right? Because you know the the, the values of the steady states change, but they stay 
One is attracting solutions, one is repelling solutions. So you can do the same thing if you ask for solutions. This time the solutions will be kind of the steady states will be between 0 and 1 but in between is going to be increasing and then it's going to be decreasing, right? Of course, again, this is going to change. This is 1. So this, the, the status is going to be less than 1, right? So in essence, nothing really dramatic happens. If you start with an initial population, You know, above a certain level, that is above the smaller of the two um, I, um, steady states, then the population is going to stabilize around the bigger steady state. Okay? So the fish are not going to die, even if you harvest at that rate. What happens if you increase the harvesting rate beyond one quarter? or add one quarter. <coughs> right hand side basically stays negative except add one half, right? So what's the solution, the slope going to look like? And slope fill. At one half, there's going to be a steady state, right? What happens above one half? Population that starts above one half. Decreases, right? What happens to population that starts below one half? Decreases, right? So it goes. Okay. By the way, this this configuration, this steady state is called um, it's it's not a sink, it's not a source, right? It's partially a sink if you want uh, for values greater than this, greater than this uh, one half, and it's you know a source for for values less than a half, right? But Again, individual values of H are not so important. The important thing is what happens for, as I said, for r whole ranges. So <clears throat> what happens if, you know, H is bigger than a quarter? Then the right-hand side dips below the, so the right-hand side is always negative. Is there any steady state? No steady state, so all the solutions are decreasing, right? Okay, so you can convince yourselves in this thing, you can actually type, you know, uh, parameters h and say h takes value whatever. So you can start with h equals zero, which would give you the logistic one, right? Um, let's do h equals a quarter, see what happens. You see that, you know, above is decreasing below, I mean, it's, it's decreasing all the way through, but it has a steady state. And for H bigger than a quarter, like 
0 0.26 there's going to be no steady state, okay? I mean, there's going to be some slowly decreasing, you know, but then eventually it's going to go fast, right? <coughs> so just the slope field was tilted just enough so there is no more um, equilibrium, no, no more steady state, okay? So, what is so again? This this kind of analysis is what's called a bifurcation analysis. And to summarize, is to write a bifurcation diagram uh, for parameter h. Okay, so. You know, whenever you're going to be asked to do a bifurcation analysis or diagram, is you're going to be you, you will know what's the parameter that you will have to vary and see what, how how that affects the the solutions. So um, <clears throat> let's plot the steady states for each individual value for, for, for different values of h that we computed. Okay? So for h equals zero we said there are two, right? Zero and one. For h equals let's say this is a quarter here, right? For h um, less than a quarter, then there are still two Right? Steady state and so forth. Then there is one, right? When when h is a quarter, there is only one steady state. Then there is none, right? Now If you kind of do it for all values of h between 0 and 1 quarter and you plot those two steady states, you're going to get basically a uh, curve which, let's see, is it a parabola or not? <coughs> Certainly it looks like a parabola if you look in the book. And I, what do you think? Well, remember, how do we comp how do we figure those those two steady states? Is where where the parabola you know the parabola that was kind of sliding up and down actually downhill was hitting the um, the um, zero you know the right hand side equals zero zero right? So it's pretty much that these two two valleys, right? So it's almost the same as if you flip this, this image and you take um, if you imagine that's the parabola that it's kind of you slide it up, um, you know, I guess to the well, you don't slide it, but I mean, at least the differ you know the difference between these two should be clear. It's exactly the same as the difference of those two uh, zeros that appear on the when you slide the parabola up and down. Right. In other words, I mean, there's there's no coincidence that this is a, ends up being a parabola. But in general, the bifurcation diagram is can be can can look totally weird. Okay. So this is. Um, if you want to be a little more more complete, then sometimes you do the following. You say, well, for this value of h, not only that these are the two equilibria, but 
they are one is sink and one is source, right? So which one was what? Um, I think this one was sink, right? This is source and this is okay. What happens for this values of H? The solution just X here, right? Just keeps going downhill, right? It's a very it's a schematic sort of summary of what we've talked about. What happens when when H is one fourth? Right? If X starts here at this value it goes towards the equilibrium, right? If x starts below, then it goes below the equilibrium, and so forth. Right? Um, <coughs> of course, it it might make sense to 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 do uh, with negative h, but then it wouldn't be harvesting, right? So we don't. We don't do this. Of course, also here is the same, right? Right? So, um, this actually turns out to be a, a pretty powerful, I mean, in this case, it's a very simple um, example. But the bifurcation diagram is, is usually very powerful because it tells you what's the range of parameter, uh, of the values of a certain parameter or a certain set of parameters for which something, uh, some behavior you want it to happen happens. Right? For instance, do you want to have a steady state that is, you know, um, do, you want, do you want the fish population to survive, right? When you have, when you have harvesting. Well, you know these are the um, these are the um, steady states, right? That are sinks, that are stable, right? So as long as this, you know, so you know H has to be in this range, right? This is an unstable, so that doesn't really make too much um, sense for, for what I said, you know, for the population to be. Um, to ex to exist and be and be pos and, and and survive. Um, let's see. In your in your example, um, I mean, one one of your homework problems, you have x prime equals x cubed minus a x. Okay. So it says, dual bifurcation diagram for this for this problem. So what do you have to do? Hmm? Find the zeros. So just think of A is fixed, right? And if, you, if it's just, you don't know where to start, you just pick a value for A, okay? I don't know, A equals 1, right? Then you, f you have the You make the um, uh, the right hand side graph, right? And we did it. It was just x minus x cubed. Um, you find the sinks and the sources, right? And then you ask yourself, well, what if a is a different value, right? So, or you can take, you know, do it do it from uh, all at once and say, let's find the zeros as a function of a, and in the end, the, the answer should look like, you know, these are the x versus a. Um, solutions. But keep in mind that you have to have all <coughs> solutions plotted. You have to have all the solutions plotted. So what, what is the, uh, how do you solve this? x, x squared minus a, right? Right. So, what will be the the diagram here? Use a different color. There's going to be 
one where um, x is always zero, right? So that's always going to exist for all values of a, even for negative values of a, right? And plus square root of a and minus square root of a, right? Well, try to do the same for uh, part C. I mean, uh, this was part B, which I assigned. But, um, of course, this is not quite the end. What do you need to do here, too, uh, also? You need to figure out which branches are sinks and which, are, which ones are sources, right? Okay. So I'll let you do that. But... Depending on the problem, you might it might be this easy or it might not be this easy. Okay, many times you just have to rely on a computer for numerical approximations. Okay, so that's that's just a you know brief, really brief example of a bifurcation uh, analysis. We're going to be coming back a lot more, and when we have 2D and so forth, so it's going to be um, much more interesting. But right now, let's just uh, talk about <coughs> periodic. Uh, forcing and periodic solutions. So, um, If, if we only looked at autonomous systems and look at the f uh, slope field and solutions uh, for autonomous systems, let's, let's look at non-autonomous equations. And we're not going to just look at, at the most general one, but we're going to be interested in um, equations. Well, let's put dx dt. equals some uh, right-hand side that only depends on x. So this would be an autonomous system, right? Plus some forcing term. give an example but this kind of forcing term we're interested in is is um, we're going to consider to be periodic and an example of this is the following so dx dt so is this the logistic x 1 minus x plus or minus. So it's the same kind of idea of, of harvesting, but um, with some periodic term. Okay. So let's see, what does this actually do here? 1 plus sine of 2 pi t, sine is between negative 1 and 1. So 1 plus that is always positive, right? So this term is always positive, between 0 and 2, right? This is between 0 and 2, and there's a constant h, something like that. So this term is subtracted from this logistic um, term. The question is, is, how do we understand the behavior of this system? Okay, for initial conditions given. Okay. okay. 
So sine. Oh, let me let me call this f of t and x because that's the right hand side is you know in general f of t and x. And let me stress the following that f of t and x is periodic in t with period one. Okay, because I have two pi, two pi t. Okay, so in other words, f of t plus one is the same as f of t in x. Okay. So it's not time independent. In other words, the direction field is not going to be invariant under translations. But some structure, um, you know, there is something to be said about uh, the solutions. Let's, uh, let me show you the direction field and let's change it from negative 2 to 2, for instance. <coughs> okay? So again, lots of directions here, but um, what's one thing that's clear now? Is you translate, you know, for, for t equals 0, right? For t equals, well, should have period 1, so it should be 0 and 2 should have the same picture. Yeah. Yes, but you, you, we, we don't see it because I, I don't, I have to put this uh, negative 1 to 2. Okay. All right, so it's clearly not not invariant on the translations, right? Because it changes. If I have different values for t, I have different values for the slope for the right hand side. But still, let's let's see. Do we have any steady states? Do you have a steady state? We need to have. The equation is up there, okay? To have a steady state, we need to have a value for x that when x takes that value for all t, then the equation is satisfied, right? Well, dx dt is not going to be, it's going to be 0 if x is constant, right? But the right-hand side is not constant. So if there is a t explicit dependence, <coughs> if it's a non-autonomous system, right? Um, it may happen that you don't have steady states. Okay? And this is an example of that. You don't have, set the right hand side equal to zero and try to solve for x independent of t. You won't be able to. Yeah. h equals 1. I'm using h0.26. Yeah, as long as h is not zero, let's see, let's see if that makes a difference. But let, let's, uh, so we're not going to have a steady state, right? But if I'm kind of looking for some pattern here, you can see that this picture is kind of periodic, right? It's like a, every one unit, if I translate every one unit here, it's going to look the same, right? So the question is, do I have a solution that actually just stays periodic with the same period. Okay. And it looks like it might, right? But how do we know? How do we know that it's not tilted just going, you know, downhill like that? Or right, you may not. For for this value of H you may have exactly that situation. Let's see. Let's see, 0 0.1. This is going uphill, right? But now it's going downhill, so there's, there looks like there might be some periodic solution. 
Right? So that's sort of the question here is do their periodic solutions exist? And by periodic solution we mean x as a function of t for which x of t plus 1 equals x of t is periodic with period 1 if x of t plus 1 equals f x of t. Okay? In fact, if I if I want to, um, I want to show you that this can happen actually with um, you know the answer might be yes. Uh, there there is there is a, a, um, a periodic solution, or yes there are more than one periodic solution, or no there is no periodic solution. This again depends on the value of h. So. If I pick the value of h to be kind of small, smaller than this, uh, zero point. Okay, let's do this, but negative zero one. Okay, there it is. Okay. So I kept the 0 0.1 for h, but I just made the windows window size between 0 and 1. Between 0 and 1. Then what do you see? There seems to be a solution that's periodic for this initial condition. Uh, where okay, t equals 0. So for x equals 0 0.1 or something, right? And there's another solution up there, right? Solutions in between kind of oscillate, but they go towards the the upper one, right? So this sort of resembles that logistic growth, but you don't have steady state. So how do you find these periodic solutions, whether they exist or not? It's called Poincaré map. So the answer is is given by this so-called Poincaré map. So here's sort of an, in a nutshell Poincaré map. Let's just schematically draw this uh, direction f or solution curves and plot the time, you know, the um, t equals 0 and t equals 1. Right? You know, let's, let's think of an initial condition that starts at x0, okay? What happens with a solution that starts at x0? Well, it does evolve, right? And assuming that solution exists for a whole period, so from 0 to 1, then at 1 it gets a new value, right? So let's say the following, so that phi of t and x naught, let's call this to be x of t solution of the differential equation that we're interested in with initial condition equals x naught. Okay? So let's introduce this notation here. Okay? It's also called a flow. So it says 
So again, this is for initial time t equals zero. Starting with the initial condition x naught at time equals zero, this function at time t gives you the value of x at time t according to that. Okay? So what will this be? This will be phi at 1 and x naught. Agree? Take another value for x naught. Um, x naught tilde, right? It's going to do whatever it does. It's going to end up at phi of 1 and x one tilde, x naught tilde, right? Now, <coughs> if you if you kind of look at these values and ignore the kind of dynamics between zero and one, and just say, given x naught, I give you this value that is uh, at at t equals one. That's a map, right? That's a map. It's it's a function, okay? A function is an assignment, right? It's a map from you know, this will be the input and this will be the output, right? So what you can see is that for different values of x naught, I get different values for um, for phi at one of x naught, right? The fact that I don't get self-intersection, or not self-intersection, but but the curves don't intersect says that if I have a, a smaller value of x naught here than this value, then phi 1 at x naught is going to be smaller than phi 1 of x1. Right? So there are some properties. So the map x naught takes phi 1 of x naught is called the Poincaré map. Okay. And here comes, I mean, you might, you might say, well, but this is, you can do this for any, any equation. Yes, but if the direction field is periodic with period one, for instance, then what's going to happen? <clears throat> well, what's going to happen is that let me draw the picture here. So since um, f of t and x naught is periodic, then I can construct the claim is that that knowing what what is this Poincaré map basically gives me the whole dynamics of the solutions. So at time equals two, for instance. If this is x naught here, right? And this is um, let, me, let me I keep introducing notation, but p of the x naught comes from Poincaré, right? So just sort of a short uh, abbreviated is x naught gives me this value p of x naught, right? Then <coughs> if I start at time t equals 1 with x naught, what's the solution going to do? It's going to do exactly the same thing as if it started at 0, right? And also, whatever it starts on p of x naught is going to be exactly what it would do if I start here with p of x naught. So I want to make sure this looks the same, right? 
Maybe I should use different colors. So whatever it does on this edge, it also does on this edge, on this um, interval. Does it make sense what I'm saying here? So whatever it did here, it also does here, and so forth. So the picture is the same, but not with any translate of the time, but only with translate by one unit, by the period. Right? So, just to conclude here, <clears throat> if I start at x naught, how can I get a periodic solution? Well, the Poincaré map should actually be the same as the starting point. So we get a periodic solution So to obtain a periodic solution, x naught should equal p of x naught. And then, of course, would equal p of p of x naught, and so forth. So x naught is, must be, a fixed point for the Poincaré map. Okay. So the periodic solution will happen exactly when you do the following. 0, 1, 2, and so forth. So if you happen to have a solution for which, you know, it does whatever, but then it comes back here, right? And you can see that it cannot come back anyway. It has to come back in a manner so that it kind of continues in the same by periodicity, right? And so forth. Then you get a periodic solution. Okay? All right. So. This is the role of the Poincaré map, is um, if we know what it is, the Poincaré map, then, and we know how many fixed points, that is, how many solutions of x equals p of x there are, then we know how many periodic solutions there are, right? The computation of the Poincaré map is not really a computation, but it's more of a, um, I mean, it doesn't give you the, the ex explicit expression for the Poincaré map. It doesn't, you won't be able, in most cases, to find, you know, this is uh, P of X, okay, and then solve explicitly. But what you can do is the following thing, um, and I'll just briefly do that, so time is, um, almost up, um, is, let me just write it here, so it's going to be P prime, so I'll give you the details next time, but P prime is E to the integral from 0 to 1 of partial of F with respect to X of S phi of s x naught ds. <clears throat> all this is saying basically is that this is, well, all you can say from this is that it's a positive quantity and as I said, p is increasing, right? And also the second derivative. And the second derivative is um, you know you just differentiate that with respect to x um, let's see this is integral from 0 to 1 
second partial of f with respect to x s 5s x I'm sorry this is at x naught at x naught times e to the whatever this integral is, right? S f with respect to s s um, u. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna omit the argument here because I don't have the space du. <coughs> so ds. So this combination will tell you how is the shape of the of the, of the function p. For instance, is it concave up? Is it concave down? Um, just for the example, when h was 0 0.1, uh, p prime was positive and p double prime was negative. So, what's the picture of the Poincare map? We don't know what exactly you know the value of p is, but p is increasing and concave down, right? So it's going to be could be something like this, right? Excuse me, no, not going downhill, right? C increasing concave down. So what is that looking like? Something like this, right? What do we look for for the Poincaré map? The fixed points, right? So the points where the graph of the Poincaré map intersects the uh, line at 45 degrees, right? Those would be the, the fixed points. So if you have two, then you have two periodic solutions, like we saw there, right? But in other situ situations, it might be that the the uh, the the um, there's only one intersection or there's no intersection, right? So that's going to give you the number of periodic solutions, right? I'll come back on this computation of the Poincaré map. Um, if there's one there's one problem I think in the homework that requires that, so you can skip that um, from the homework. But I want to keep the rest sort of to um, to do for Wednesday. All right?